Theistic Evolution Critique, Human Origins and Missing Transitions. We've been discussing the book Theistic Evolution, um, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. And um, that's what the book itself looks like. Um, we're, going to, we're going to be discussing um, theistic evolution in what you might call its anti-ID form. You can divide up human uh, responses to uh, the data that we have regarding uh, ancient history, archaeology, geology, etc., into several groups. One of them is, I'm going to call it young life creationism because that's the part that belongs together. Uh, the other one is traditionally labeled old earth creationism, but we would be better labeled old life creation, where God actually creates things more or less de novo, mostly more, but it's spread out over millions of in fact, billions of years. Then there's intelligent design, friendly theistic evolution. It says things happen gradually, but God helped it along because it couldn't do it by itself. Then there's non-ID theistic evolution, which is basically says, yes, God may have helped the process out. He either helped it out or he designed it in such a way that where, where it would go automatically. But in any case, it's done so well that you can't find an obvious hand of God in it other than uh, that God's hand is in everything. And then there's atheistic evolution, which says there's no trace of a hand of God because there is no God. The book is not taking aim primarily at atheistic evolution, it is taking aim at non-intelligent design theistic evolution. Keep that in mind as we uh, go through this. Uh, the chapters we'll be talking about are by Ann Gager and Casey Luskin. First, the chapter by Ann Gager. It's, uh, both of these chapters are in part one, the scientific critique of theistic evolution but not just in general. Now we're going to be talking about the case against universal common descent and for a unique human origin. And the first chapter we'll look at is uh, Engager's chapter, which is the battle over human origins, which is an introduction to the chapters 14 through 16. And 14 is the one we will do immediately afterwards today. The summary of Gager's chapter is, the origin of humanity, where we came from, is an issue with many ramifications. It impacts our self-understanding in mul multiple ways. Did we evolve from a common ancestor shared with chimps, or might we have a unique origin? Mainstream science says that it is incontrovertible that we are the product, uh, product of evolution. It is, is it therefore necessary to adapt our understanding of scripture, or might the science be overstated? This short chapter, along with chapters 14 and 16, uh, through 16, will argue that the question of our origin is far from settled and that there are scientific arguments to be made in favor of a unique origin for humanity. There is no need to change traditional scriptural interpretations based on inconclusive science. As you can see, that last, chapter, uh, that last sentence was a direct aim at theistic evolution that is not ID friendly, but more than that, theistic evolution that does not see uh, Adam and Eve as real people. The intersection of evolutionary theory with Christian faith, in particular on the topic of human origins, leads immediately to one question. Are we descended from the first two parents or not? This question raises a multitude of difficulties, both theologically and scientifically. Not surprisingly, the Christian church is divided on this issue, with some emphasizing the scientific arguments and some the biblical. The standard scientific worldview accepts neo-Darwinism as the explanation for our origin. 
more specifically concerning human origins, the neo-Darwinian view is that we have a purely natural origin, fully explicable by unguided natural selection acting on random variation. According to this view, the fossil record shows that we evolved from an ape-like ancestor and we share a common ancestry with chimps, and we evolved from a population of several thousand at a minimum. Theistic evolutionists operate from the perspective that this received view is accurate and trustworthy, in fact, more likely to be understood correctly than thousands of years of theological tradition. In their view, the scientific evidence against the possibility of a historical Adam and Eve is overwhelming. Our common descent from ape-like ancestors is obvious. Thus, the first chapters of Genesis are viewed as non-historical, although the note says that some people say, well, God picked out one particular man and one particular woman from this group uh, and made them the first man and woman the, with a soul or something like that. In this section of the book, we are focusing on the scientific evidence relating to human origins. Nevertheless, we acknowledge that the debate over human origins is so consequential because it has implications that go beyond science. The difficulty for many Christians, as is pointed out in Wade Grudem's biblical and theological introduction, which we'll see later on. Um, actually, no, there's one of them is at the beginning, and then, and then we'll see the, the section on biblical and theological uh, stuff, is that discarding traditional readings of Genesis seems to vitiate the basis for essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Many of the theistic evolutionists who advocate for acceptance of the neo-Darwinian story themselves claim that the scientific evidence necessitates the loss of a historical first couple, human couple, which in turn removes the idea of original sin and the fall, among other things. It is important to stress that the Darwinian story in its unadulterated form is purely materialistic. It says that we are supposed to have evolved through an unguided process into the modern humanity we see today. The appearance of intelligence, language, and even morality and spirituality are attributed to unguided and incremental natural selection. Either that or some highly improbable coincidence of which we are the lucky recipients. There is no story of the infusion of a soul at any point because in the materialistic worldview, there are no souls. Intelligence, language, morality, and spirituality are all the product of happenstance and the gradual selection of more fit individuals. They derive not from any higher power, but from the evolutionary process, which leads to increasingly complex social development. Darwin wrote quite clearly on this point. The idea of a universal and beneficent creator does not seem to arise in the mind of man until he has been elevated by long-continued culture. So our religion is an evolutionary development as well. In short, man is not made in God's image. God is made in man's image. It follows that our moral sense, as Darwin called it, is the product of our social instincts whatever they are. And of course, there's a citation from Darwin on that. Even consciousness disappears into the naturalistic mindset, which is ironic indeed. To paste the idea of, an, of a benevolent creator onto this Darwinian story is like slapping a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. How does one to staunch the bleeding? If the new Darwinian understanding of human origins has consequences this drastic, it is imperative that it be carefully examined for its rigor and veracity. Is it possible that in the efforts to accept a prevailing neo-Darwinian view, theistic evolutionists have lost sight of the truth? Might the story actually be wrong? Scientific consensus has been wrong many times. Phlogiston, humoral pathology, luminiferous ether, astrology, globalism, spontaneous generation, eugenics, the list could go on. And it would be a shame, surely, to discard our Christian heritage for a mess of pottage. Um, the next uh, chat, uh, paragraph talks about neo-Darwinism following in Darwin's footsteps, and it goes. And the next paragraph says, "And there is no, and there is good reason to doubt for doubt about the story. Neo-Darwinism fails to explain many significant things in biology, as should be apparent from the previous chapters." It cannot account for the origin of information, the appearance of complex body plants in the Cambrian, or how an embryo develops into an adult. Even the idea of common descent, an idea that is essential for the neo-Darwinian story, is subject to challenge. Alternate theories such as those offered by the extended evolutionary synthesis 
also have problems. So just at a time when neo-Darwinism seems to be collapsing, why should Christians accept the story of our evolutionary origin from apes? Should we not investigate the merits of the case? Most especially, should we not examine the evidence that is offered in support of the theory of human evolution? The argument, because of the settled science of today, theistic evolutionists or evolutionary creationists accept the idea that our common ancestry of our common ancestry with chimps. To review, three dubious claims have been made concerning this. First, the fossil evidence reveals intermediates between us and our ape-like ancestors, apparently bridging the gap between us and them. That's the subject of the next chapter. Second, the fact that our DNA is nearly identical to chimp DNA is taken as evidence of our common ancestry. Third, population genetics says that the first steps on the way to humanity arose in a population of about 10,000 and that no fewer than several thousand ancestors could have ever existed in the human lineage. Meaning, of course, no Adam and Eve. Now, are these claims true? How solid is the science behind them? That is what we examine in the next three chapters, 14 through 16. These chapters will make the following key points. One, the actual evidence in the fossil record is starkly at odds with the narrative of human evolution. Realistic candidates for species transitional to humans are conspicuous by their absence. And that's what we'll cover in the rest of this uh, uh, talk. The Two, the alleged similarity between humans and chimpanzees at the genetic level is exaggerated. As our understanding of the complexity of the genome increases, so does the realization of the differences between humans and chimps. In particular, arguments relating to junk DNA have been vitiated by recent discoveries concerning the important and often species-specific functions of these elements of the genome. Um, the time needed for humans to have evolved from an ancestor in common with chimps is orders of magnitude greater than the time available in conventional evolutionary models. We'll be covering that. I think that's the next chapter. Um, Conventional population genetic models assume a common descent of humans, that chimps and humans share a common ancestor. We propose an alternative model, one based on a unique origin of an original pair of humans with initial created diversity, giving four versions of each initial non-sex chromosome. This is consistent with the evidence of a block structure for a large percentage of human DNA and is open to verification by means of computer simulation. For all these reasons, the hypothesis of our shared ancestry with chimps, a hypothesis most contentious among Christians and vital to the theistic evolutionary position, is deeply flawed and is a very unsound basis for revising the very foundations of Christian doctrine. <coughs> Again, notice the, uh, uh, notice the attack is not... Uh, or the dispute is not against um, atheistic evolution in particular. It's against Christians who try to graft that onto their Christianity. Now we get to the first of those three chapters that were mentioned. Missing Transitions, Human Origins and the Fossil Record by Casey Luskin. In summary, the standard evolutionary view of human origins generally accepted by theistic evolutionists holds that our species, Homo sapiens, evolved from ape-like species through apparently unguided evolutionary processes like natural selection and random mutation. Theistic evolutionists and other evolutionary scientists often claim the fossil evidence for this Darwinian ev evolution of humans from ape-like creatures is incontrovertible. But their viewpoint is not supported by the fossil evidence. Hominin fossils generally fall into one of two groups, ape-like species and human-like species, with a large unbridged gap between them. Those of you who have been through contested bones will recognize that argument. Virtually the entire hominin fossil record is marked by fragmented fossils, especially the early hominins, which do not document precursors to humans. Around three to four million years ago, the Australopithecines appear, but they were generally ape-like and also appear in an abrupt manner. 
When our genus Homo appears, it also does so in an abrupt fashion, without clear evidence of a transition from previous ape-like hominins. Major members of Homo are very similar to modern humans, and their differences amount to small-scale microevolutionary changes. The archaeological record shows an explosion of human creativity about 30 to 40,000 years ago. Despite the claims of evolutionary paleoanthropologists and the media hype surrounding many hominin fossils, the fragmented hominin fossil record does not document the evolution of humans from ape-like precursors, and the appearance of humans in the fossil record is anything but a gradual Darwinian evolutionary process. Theistic evolutionists should appreciate that Christians who doubt standard evolutionary accounts of human origins hold legitimate views that are backed by scientific evidence. Notice he's not claiming that all of the evidence fits or even most of the evidence fits, but that there is a substantial portion of the evidence that fits uh, this, uh, the view that the evolutionary story is incorrect. Okay, starting the um, the main part of the of the chapter, evolutionists commonly tell the public that the fossil evidence for the Darwinian evolution of our species, Homo sapiens, from ape-like creatures, is uncontrovertible. Theistic evolutionists are no exception. In 2009, Southern Me Methodist University anthropology professor Ronald Weatherington testified before the Texas State Board of Education that human evolution has arguably the most complete sequence of fossil succession of any mammal in the world. No gaps. No lack of transitional fossils. And those are Luskin's ellipses. So when people talk about the lack of transitional fossils or gaps in the fossil record, it absolutely is not true. And it is not true specifically for our own species. That is the claim and it's being made by a theistic evolutionist. According to Wetherington, human origins show a nice, clean example of what Darwin thought was a gradualistic evolutionary change. Theistic evolutionists like Wetherington, who teach at Christian universities, are often adamant about the evidence for human evolution, sometimes more so than their counterparts at secular schools. Oof! But does the fossil record support their claims? Digging into the technical literature reveals a story starkly different from the one presented by Wetherington and other evolutionists. Far from supplying a nice, clean example of gradualistic evolutionary change that has no gaps or no lack of transitional fossils, the record shows a dramatic discontinuity between ape-like and human-like forms. Human-like fossils appear abruptly in the record without clear evolutionary precursors, contradicting Darwinian expectations. The fossil record does not show that humans evolved from ape-like precursors. The fragmented field of paleoanthropology. The discipline of paleoanthropology studies uh, the fossil remains of ancient hominins and hominids. Hominins and hominids may be defined differently depending on which expert you consult, but this chapter will define hominins as humans and all of our extinct, supposed, ancestors and relatives uh, tracing back to our, again, supposed most recent com common ancestor with chimpanzees. Obviously, Luskin does not want to uh, make that definite. The term hominid is often used in roughly the same manner, although officially it means any member of the family hominidae, including humans, great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, and any extinct species descended from their proposed most recent common ancestor. So it's the whole, um, it's basically the higher primates. Um, thus a hominin is a hominid, but a hominid is not necessarily a hominin. Hominids are on the way to humans. Paleoanthropologists face many daunting challenges in their quest to explain human evolution from this hypothetical human-ape common ancestor. Their field is fragmented in multiple senses, making it difficult to bolster evolutionary accounts of human origins. First, the fossil record is fragmented, and long periods of time exist for which there are few hominin fossils. National Geographic acknowledges fossils attributed to Homo in the period two to three million years ago are exceedingly rare. 
and you could put them all into a small shoe box and still have room for a good pair of shoes. So fragmentary and disconnected is the data, according to Harvard zoologist Richard Lewontin, a noted creationist, um, <laughs> that despite the excited and optimistic claims that have been made by some paleontologists, no fossil hominid species can be established as our direct ancestor. A second challenge is the fragmented nature of the fossil specimens themselves. Typical hominid fossils consist of mere bone scraps, making it difficult to form definitive conclusions about their morphology, behavior, and relationships. Primatologist Franz de Waal observed that the skeleton of the common chimpanzee is nearly identical to the bonobo, but they have great differences in behavior. On the sole basis of a few bones and skulls, writes de Waal, no one would have dared to propose the dramatic behavioral differences recognized today between the bonobo and the chimpanzee. He issues a warning for paleontologists who are reconstructing social life from fossilized remnants of long extinct species, problems that intensify when fossil bones are missing. Indeed, this is often the case. As Stephen Jay Gould, another noted creationist, commented, uh, most hominid fossils, even though they serve as a basis for endless speculation and elaborate storytelling, are fragments of jaws and, skulls and scraps of skulls. <clears throat> Flesh reconstructions of extinct hominins are likewise subjective, probably even more than the bones. They often attempt to do, diminish the intellectual abilities of humans and overstate those of apes. One high school textbook caricatures Neanderthals as intellectually primitive even though they exhibited intelligence and culture and casts Homo erectus as a bungling stooped form even though its skeleton is extremely similar to modern humans. Conversely, the same textbook portrays an australopithecine, which in reality had a chimp-sized brain, with gleams of human-like intelligence and emotion, a common tactic in illustrated books on human origins. University of North Carolina Charlotte anthropologist Jonathan Marks warns against such fallacies of humanizing apes and apifying humans. The words of the famed physical anthropologist Ernest Houghton from Harvard University remain valid. Alleged rest restorations of ancient types of man have very little, if any, scientific value and are likely only to mislead the public. The third, the field itself is fragmented. The sparse nature of the data combined with the desire to make confident assertions about human evolution often betrays objectivity and leads to sharp disagreements. An article in Science titled The Politics of Paleoanthropology, compared the tax of reconstructing human evolution to that of reconstructing the plot of war and peace with 13 randomly selected pages, leading to conflicts that make it difficult to separate the personal from the scientific disputes raging in the field. Similarly, Donald Johansson and Blake Edgar divulge that ambition and lifelong quest for recognition, funding, and fame can make it difficult for paleoanthropologists to admit when they are wrong. Remember, Johansson is the discoverer of Lucy. And I'm not going to read the paragraph because you can pretty much imagine what it says. And if you really want to know, read the book. The <clears throat> quest for recognition can inspire outright contempt towards other researchers. After interviewing paleoanthropologists for a documentary, PBS Nova producer Mark Davis recounted that each Neanderthal expert thought that the last one I talked to was an idiot, if not an actual Neanderthal. <laughs> the standard story of human evolution. Despite the disagreements, there is a standard story of human evolution which is retold in countless textbooks, news media articles, and coffee table books. Indeed, virtually all the scientists cited in this chapter accept some evolutionary account of human origins. A representation of the most commonly believed hominin phylogeny is portrayed in figure 14.1, which I will show you. And most of you have seen this kind of thing with Sahel Anthropus, whoops, there, down here, and then Orion, and then Artipithecus, and then the Australopithecus ones, and then going to Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, and modern humans. Many of you have probably seen that. 
starting with early hominins and moving through the Australopithecines and then into the genus Homo, this chapter will review the fossil evidence and assess whether it supports the standard account of human evolution. As we shall see, the evidence, or lack thereof, often contradicts this evolutionary story. Early hominins. In 2015, two leading paleoanthropologists reviewed the fossil evidence regarding human evolution in a prestigious scientific volume entitled Macroevolution. They acknowledged the dearth of unambiguous evidence for ancestor-descendant lineages and admitted... The evolutionary sequence for the majority of hominin lineages is unknown. Most hominin taxa, particularly early hominins, have no obvious ancestors, and in most cases, ancestor-descendant sequences, fossil time series, cannot be reliably constructed. Skipping over a paragraph, um, Australopithecus... Uh, oh, no, this is A. Sahelanthropus uh, chadensis the two my skull. Although Sahel Anthropus chadensis, also known as uh, called the two my skull, is known only from one skull and some jaw fragments, it has been called the oldest known hominin on the human line. But not everyone agrees. Bridget uh, Sinud of the Natural History Museum in Paris called to my the skull of a female gorilla and co-wrote in Nature that Sahel Anthropus was an ape, not bipedal, and that many features link the specimen with chimpanzees, gorillas, or both, to the exclusion of hominids. This debate has continued, but leading authorities caution that teeth and skull fragments alone are probably not reliable for reconstructing the phylogenetic relationships of higher primate species and genera, including those among the hominins. Unfortunately for hominins like Sahelanthropus, craniodental fragments are all we have. That actually may not be true. There may be a femur, as I recall, in which case it's an ape. In his testimony at the 2009 Texas Evolution Hearings, Ronald Wetherington, whom we heard at the beginning, stated that every fossil we find reinforces the sequence that we had previously supposed to exist rather than suggesting something different. But Sahel Anthropus provides a striking counterexample to that assertion. Commenting on to my Bernard Wood of George Washington University observed a single fossil can fundamentally change the way we reconstruct the tree of life and explained that if this advanced looking skull belonged to our ancestor, then it plays havoc with the tiny model of human origin, tidy model of human origins. In other words, if Sahel Anthropus was a human ancestor, then many later supposed human ancestors, including the Australopithecines, are forced out of our family line. Oops. Precious little Orion to Genensis. Orion, pardon me, which means original man in a Kenyan language, was a chimpanzee sized primate known only from an assortment of bone fragments, including pieces of the arm, thigh, lower jaw, and some teeth. When initially discovered, the New York Times declared fossil may be earliest human link and reported that Orion may be the earliest known ancestor of the human family. Nature responded to such hype by warning that the, excite, the, the excitement needs to be tempered with caution in assessing the claim of a six million year old direct ancestor of modern humans. That seems like wise advice. If Orin did provide an upright walking hominin from six million years ago, would that qualify it as our ancestor? Not necessarily. According to a nature commentary, one such ape, Oreopithecus, acquired bipedalism convergently with humans. Convergent evolution, where we heard that before. As two critics argue in nature, Orin is not a hominin, and we are a long way from a consensus on its role in human evolution. And that should be a superscript. Um, that's my fault. The Ardipithecus ramidus. I wish to do or breakthrough of the year. In 2009, science announced the long-awaited publications of Ardipithecus ramidus, a would-be hominin fossil that lived about 4.4 million years ago. Expectations mounted after its discovery, uh, discoverer, UC Berkeley paleoanthropologist Tim White, promised a phenomenal individual that would be the Rosetta Stone for understanding bipedalism. The media eagerly employed the hominin they 
affectionately dubbed Artie to evangelize the public for Darwin. The Discovery Channel, the Associated Press, and Science Magazine, and you can imagine what they said. Calling Artie new may have been a poor word choice since she was discovered in the early 1990s. Why did it take some 15 years to publish the analysis? A 2002 article in Science explains the bones were so soft, crushed, squished, and chalky that White reported, when I clean an edge, it erodes so that I have to mold every one of the broken pieces to reconstruct it. Later reports similarly acknowledged that portions of Artie's skeleton were found crushed nearly to smithereens and needed extensional, uh, pardon me, extensive digital reconstruction, including the pelvis, which looked like an Irish stew. National Geographic similar, similarly noted that Artie's trampled remains were badly crushed and distorted and so fragile they would turn to dust at a touch. Claims about bipedal locomotion require accurate measurements of the precise shapes of key bones like the pelvis. Can one trust declarations of a Rosetta Stone for understanding bipedalism when Artie was crushed to smithereens? Science quoted various paleoanthropologists who were skeptical that the crushed pelvis really shows the anatomical details needed to demonstrate bipedality. Esteban Sarmiento, Bernard Wood, and Richard Klein all said basically that same thing. Um, later hominins, the Australopithecines. Many paleoanthropologists believe the Australopithecines were upright walking hominins and ancestral to our genus Homo. Dig into the details, however, and ask basic questions like who, where, and when, and there is much controversy. As we'll discuss in parts five and six of this chapter, one paper noted there is little consensus on which species of Australopithecus is the closest to Homo, if any. Even the origin of the genus Australopithecus itself is unclear. Retroactive confessions of ignorance. In 2006, National Geographic ran a story titled, Fossil Find is Missing Link in Human Evolution, as scientists say, reporting the discovery of what the Associated Press called the most complete chain of human evolution so far. The fossils belong to, belonging to species Australopithecus anamensis were said to link Artipithecus to its supposed Australopithecine descendants. What exactly was found? According to the technical paper, the claims were based upon canine teeth of intermediate masticatory robusticity. If a few teeth of intermediate size and shape make the most complete chain of human ev evolution so far, then the evidence for human evolution must be indeed quite modest. Besides learning to distrust media hype, there's another lesson here. Accompanying the praise of this missing link were retroactive confessions of ignorance, where evolutionists acknowledge a severe gap in their model only after thinking they had found evidence to plug the gap. Thus, the technical paper reporting these teeth admitted that until recently, the origins of Australopithecus were obscured by a sparse fossil record. It continued... The origin of Australopithecus, the genus right, widely interpreted as ancestral to Homo, is a central problem in human evolutionary studies. Australopithecus species differ markedly from extant African apes and candidate ancestral hominids such as Artipithecus orin and Sahelanthropus. Evolutionists who retroactively confess ignorance about some previously unfilled gap risk falling into a situation where the new evidence which supposedly filled the gap may not prove very convincing. This seems to be the case here. Moreover, we're left with uncontested admissions that the Australopithecines differ markedly from their supposed early hominin ancestors. Australopithecine origins apparently remain obscure. Australopithecines are like apes. While Ardipithecus orun and Sahelanthropus are controversial due to their fragmentary remains, there are sufficiently sufficient known Australopithecine specimens to generally understand their morphology. Australopithecus, which literally means southern ape, is a genus of extinct hominins that lived in Africa from 5 to 1.2 million years ago. Splitters, paleoanthropologists who infer many different species, and lumpers, those who see fewer, have created a variety of taxonomic schemes for the Australopithecines. The four most commonly accepted species are Afarensis, Lucy, 
um, Africanus, Robustus, and Boise. Robustus and Boise are larger boned and more robust and are sometimes classified with the genus Paranthropus. The most well-known Australopithecine fossil is Lucy, which belonged to Afarensis, one of the most complete known fossils among pre-homo hominins. She is often described as a bipedal ape-like creature that is an ideal precursor to humans. In 2009, I visited, that's Casey Luskin, of course, a traveling exhibit of Lucy's bone. In addition to the fact that Lucy did not look human-like, see figure 14.2, which we'll omit, I was also struck by the incompleteness of her skeleton. Only 40% was found in a large percentage of mere rib fragments. Very little useful material from Lucy's skull was recovered, and yet she is one of the most significant specimens ever found. There are some possible reasons for skepticism over whether Lucy represents a single individual or even a single species. In an exhibit video, Lucy's discoverer, John Johansson, admitted that her bones were found scattered across a hillside. Indeed, in 2015, it was decided that one of Lucy's vertebrae probably came from a baboon. It wasn't even an australopithecine. Skipping over stuff, his small chimp-like head, body was quite ape-like, relatively long and curved fingers, relatively long arms, funnel-shaped chest, species knuckle walk as chimps and gorillas do. And they actually, they have a wrist locking that will enable them to put more weight on it. Um, Richard Leakey and Robert, uh, Roger Lewin argued that Australopithecus afarensis and other Australopithecines almost certainly were not adapted to a striding gait and running as humans are. They recount a paleontologist Peter Schmidt's striking surprise upon realizing Lucy's non-human qualities. Um, everyone had talked about Lucy as being very modern, very human, so I was surprised by what I saw. And if you want to read more about it, it's the quotes in the book. Um, Other studies confirm Australopithecine differences from humans and similarities with apes. Their inner ear canals, responsible for balance and related to locomotion, are different from Homo, but similar to great apes. Traits like their ape-like developmental patterns and ape-like ability for prehensile grasping by their toes led a nature reviewer to say that ecologically they, that is the Australopithecines, may still be considered as apes. As for Lucy's, Lucy's pelvis, many claim it indicated, uh, indicates bipedal locomotion, but Johansson and his team report it was badly crushed with distortion and cracking when first discovered. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? These problems led one commentator in the Journal of Human Evolution to propose that Lucy's pelvis is so different from other australopithecines and so close to the human condition due to error in the reconstruction, creating a very human-like sacral plane. Lacking intermediates. If humans evolved from ape-like creatures, what were the transitional species between the ape-like hominins just discussed and the truly human-like members of the Homo genius found in the human, uh, in the fossil record? There aren't any good candidates. The demise of Homo habilis. Ann Tattersall, an anthropologist at the American Museum of Natural History, called it a wastebasket tax on little more than convenient recipient for a motley assortment of hominin fossils and believes more than one hominin species is represented. Skipping over a bunch, Homo naledi versus Australopithecus sediba, the link resurrected. And there's a number of paragraphs that I won't read on that has a lot of detail that doesn't come to any particular conclusion. Commenting on sediba, Harvard's Daniel Lieberman said, the origins of the genus Homo remain as murky as ever. And Donald Johansson remarked, the transition to Homo continues to be almost totally confusing. Even Lee Berger, the discoverer, who has a vested interest in having this thing be a human ape transition, acknowledged when publishing on Sediba that the ancestry of Homo and its relationship to early osteopithecines remain unresolved. Skipping over some more. A uh, Big Bang origin of Homo. After realizing that Habilis could not serve as a link between Homo and Australopithecus, 
Two paleoanthropologists lamented this muddle leaves Homo erectus without a clear ancestor, without a past. In other words, the missing link is still missing. Homo erectus appears abruptly without apparent evolutionary precursors. Skipping over a bunch, all in the family. In contrast to the Australopithecines, the major members of Homo erectus and the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, are very similar to us. Some paleoanthropologists have even classified erectus and neanderthalensis as members of our own species, Homo sapiens. Skipping over uh, more, getting to the conclusion, despite the claims of evolutionary paleoanthropologists and unceasing media hype, the fragmented fo hominin fossil record does not document the evolution of humans from ape-like precursors. While the hominin fossil record is marked by incomplete and fragmented fossils, known hominins fall into two separate groups, ape-like and human-like, with a distinct gap between them. The genus Homo appears in an abrupt non-Darwinian fashion without evidence of an evolutionary transition from ape-like hominins. Other members of Homo appear very similar to modern humans and their differences amount to small-scale microevolutionary change providing no evidence that we are related to non-human-like species. But there's more evidence that contradicts an evolutionary model. Many researchers recognize an explosion of modern human-like culture in the archaeological record about 35 to 40,000 years ago, showing the abrupt appearance of human creativity, technology, art, and even paintings, showing the rapid emergence of self-awareness, group identity, and symbolic thought. One reviewer dubbed this the creative explosion. In data, a 2014 paper co-authored by leading paleoanthropologists admit that, admits that we have essentially no explanation of how and why our linguistic computations and representations evolved. Since non-human animals provide virtually no relevant parallels to human linguistic communication. This abrupt appearance of modern human-like morphology, intellect, and culture contradicts evolutionary models and may indicate design events in human history. Of course, there is room for civil disagreement among Christians on these questions, but theistic evolutionists who believe that humans evolved from ape-like species should, at the very least, temper their rhetoric in the light of the sparse fossil evidence. They certainly should not demand that the church accept the evolutionary consensus on human origins. The fossil evidence simply isn't that clear. If anything, the fossil record contradicts the central evolutionary claim that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. After all, as noted earlier, two top paleoanthropologists have admitted that the evolutionary sequence for the majority of hominin lineage is unknown, and that should be a reference again. With the fossil evidence for human evolution so weak, why should our theistic evolutionist brothers and sisters insist that the church must adopt their viewpoint? That's how he finishes. Now, I think both Ann Gager and Casey Luskin are on record as believing in the standard uh, geological time scale. They do not explicitly reconcile the age of Homo, which is supposed to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two million years, with mitochondrial Eve, which is 200,000 years, and Y chromosome Adam, which is a little bit less, uh, although those are statistical and not necessarily uh, uh, mandatory for them to be in that order, but it's interesting that they are. And the emergence of human culture, about 15, I, I need to correct that, they're about 35,000 years in their telling. So, did, is Adam and Eve 35,000? Is it uh, Y chromosome? Is it Homo? Or were the pre Homo, uh, or pre -homo sapiens ones not really human? Um, I think Casey Luskin does a creditable job of surveying the ape to human transition. It's a little faster. It's not as thorough as Roop and Sanford's contested bones but manages to hit most of the, hi the highlights. There are subtle differences in emphasis, and perhaps the most interesting thing is that the chapter, although I didn't read the entire chapter to you, I did read the entire chapter, and Luskin does not mention the footprints in Crete 
which had come out by the time this uh, article was written. To repeat, Luskin does not deal with the question of whether Adam and Eve were the first of the genus Homo or whether they were more recent and therefore some hominids were not descendants of Adam and Eve. But he does, I think, make a fair case for Homo being distinct from apes. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, uh, Ariel. Yeah. I find both these chapters really interesting, but <clears throat> uh, it's uh, this is becoming an old story. Uh, what I what stimulated my thinking here is <clears throat> I'm talking about so many of these arising 40,000 years ago. What I would like to see is to put us put all the carbon-14 dates, assuming that there's some uh, even collection of this uh, uh, and so on, uh, to get to see if we find a plateau around 40,000 years. Uh, which uh, well uh, would be interesting. We, we find a great variety, but uh, uh, forty thousand. Uh, I can't remember if Bob Brown settled on that as a as a plateau or not. But uh, I think we need more work in that area. Well, um, if you take the dinosaur data seriously. Um, then it's arguable that there's a plateau around maybe depends on whether you regard the dinosaurs or the coal as more reliable, but um, somewhere between, say, 30 to 35,000 years and 40,000 years. So if that's what you're looking for, I guess you could say we might be able to find it. And who knows, we may be able to do, uh, to get some of that published. It'll be interesting to see. You, know, you had uh, the comments here about uh, uh, hominids, and um, you've, got, you've got some interesting data here to, uh, yeah. to deal with. You know, what I, what I see is if you're going to make all of, Homo into variants of Homo sapiens. Then Adam and Eve need to be two million years old, or else you have to question the dating methods. You want to leave Hobbelus out of that one? Oh, Hobbelus is a wastebasket taxon, and most people will say that. But I'm talking about Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, uh, Homo so rudolfensis, and there's a uh, Heidelbergensis and a few other ones like that. Um, you know, Luskin's not dealing with that very interesting question. Where do you put Adam and Eve? Do you put him to, uh, them two million years ago? Do you put them 200,000 years ago according to the uh, standard interpretation of you know, mitochondria and Y chromosomes? Or do you put them at um, uh, 35,000 years ago when this sudden culture thing comes up? And of course, if you question the dating, those all three may be related to each other. And of course, it, got, it gets more interesting when we have apparent human-like footprints in Crete um, supposedly 5.7 million years ago. And if you trust the geologic column, it's pretty secure. You can also try 6,000 according to the Bible. Well, you know, if it turned out to be 20,000, I think uh, one could adjust to that more easily from a short chronology than from a long chronology. But I agree that I think that... Um, Somewhere between six and seven point five thousand is more likely to turn out to be correct. Well, I have a question on that thirty five, forty thousand. So is it, so how are they coming up with that figure? 
The thirty-five to forty thousand. Yeah. Um, oh, well, that is where you start seeing just the layering, the cave paintings, and you know, stuff like that. Based some on kind of dating thing or, or layering and yeah. generation assumption of generations and you know, I was talking to Larry Garrity about this. I mean, <clears throat> there we we just did this Israel Egypt trip and does he want to put it out further than that or well no he I asked him he said put it all the archaeology together what's the longest you would say he said about fifteen thousand okay. and and the other uh, guy too said well maybe about ten. Even with well, their assumptions, uh, yeah, and, and of course that would make the that would make the choice of those three options even even wilder. And of course, when you realize that, at least for uh, mitochondrial Eve, there's some good evidence that human uh, and other animal, by the way, uh, mitochondria mm -hmm. mutate much more rapidly than they thought at first. Uh, suddenly brings that down to, according to, I think it's nature, uh, 6,500 years. And, and of course that's a, you know, that's a range at between <coughs> four and 8,000 years. Um, and the article goes on to say, but nobody believes that. So I guess I still don't see the essential kernel here of why we have to uh, uh, put it into a 6,000s th thing. So, I mean, the genealogies don't agree. They look like they're, there's parts left out in each you know list, and we don't know for sure about the words for sons and grandsons. And, and so I guess what's the driving force to fit this into 6,000 versus, what, you know, 10, 15, uh, whatever. Well, part of the driving force is that mm -hmm. if you do take those as father-son relationships, it does come out to pretty close to 6,000. Ba that's based on certain assumptions, too. That then. is based on assumptions. And, um, and so which genealogy... You're, and you're choosing course, incomplete genealogies. And of course, not. around 6,000 years tempted people to say, well, it was exactly 6,000 years. Um, and uh, so. Uh, Based on the spirit of prophecy, Bishop Lightfoot or, or, went, went on to say that it was uh, 4004 BC was creation. And in fact, it's October something at nine o'clock in the morning, um, which seems to me to be a little a little reach. Um, if I were if I were trying to make sense of all of that, uh, I would say that the indication for it being you know less than fifteen thousand years is a lot stronger than the evidence for it being, let's say, you know, 6,000. Um, and until we have something better that will fit everything in, I'm not sure that I would say 6,000 exactly. Although, if you wanted me to lay my bets, you know, kind of like we do in the emergency department with uh, somebody coming in who's drunk and um, looks to me like, you know, about a 0 0.32. Nah, it's 0.28. You know, we're just yeah. we're just uh, laying our bets and where, where it's going to wind up. I mean, the, the, I mean, because the essential part to me would be the an intelligence, a creator, um, you know, so on the one hand, so to me, it's well, he could do he could do it however he wants. You know, it, it doesn't oh, really matter. I mean, from a, I mean, even if you're going to say short age, um, I mean, that could be a twenty thousand, even fifty thousand time frame in yeah. relation to yeah. ages, and uh, you still haven't given or surrendered any 
essential ingredient to me. So that's so that's what yeah. I guess what I'm well, asking is to be educated. What would be the essential it, it, ingredient it, we're sacrificing uh, okay, to were, acknowledge a longer yeah. time frame? If you were asking me to lay my bet down, you know, where I'm going to put it, I, I would say creation about 3,985 or, 3, or something like that. But, you know, I that's... So, I mean, if we're there, having there fun are speculating... Of, there are multiple assumptions that would go into that, and the discussion of how that would work uh, would... I would not. I would not want to be stuck on that as as the absolute. Yeah. That's that well, is just where where I would put it. But but as as my as my best guess in knowing that that there's a huge range all the way from somewhat under uh, four thousand BC to probably uh, thirteen thousand BC or something like that. What, how much? Uh, Thirteen thousand. Okay, I mean I'm okay with the 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 problem solving attempt and the fun of trying to establish something, <clears throat> you know, as precise as as we're able to. But I guess I still want to know. It's it's like, um, you know, if if we did accept a little bit longer, are we running into a problem with something else? So are we trying no. to fit multiple principles together? And so if we yeah. go longer than. 6,000, then we're bumping up against some other revealed yeah. thing, then that's that's kind of what I'm searching for. Now, I, I, the way I view Ellen White in this regard is that she just simply took the numbers that were in her Bible and assumed that they were correct. Yeah. And uh, um, I don't see any place where you know she says, God showed me it was 6,000 years ago, uh, at which point I would be a whole lot uh, it would be a whole lot harder yeah. for me. Well, that would be a different discussion. Yeah. So it's sort of like the number of rooms in the Paradise Sanitarium or something. That well, she she yeah, said, well, yeah. I, you know, it wasn't an issue that I had to no, no, invoke and some inspirational they, no, ability I, for it. They didn't argue because there wasn't any obvious reason right. to. Um, and, um, and, and I think that, you know, if it turns out that 7,500 actually fits a whole bunch of stuff together, then I think we should go with 7,500. Uh, I don't see that it makes a huge difference. However, if you don't have an Adam and Eve, it does make a huge difference, and that's one of the things we'll come to in uh, in uh, 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 in our, when we go to the theological stuff. And like I say, once we start doing that, it really starts pushing you towards a short-age creationistic yes, point of view. We do the dendrochronology stuff and also the ice core stuff. Yeah, you, there's a whole bunch of stuff you got to deal with there. <laughs> well, <clears throat> pardon me. How credible is the evidence for humans having originated uh, from a population of thousands of somewhat similar organisms. You're about two chapters too early. We'll get to that. Well, the question is pretty relevant to the discussion. No, right it now. is relevant to the discussion. I agree with you. I'm just saying it's going gonna, it's gonna to take uh, uh, a whole 40 minutes to set that discussion up. And uh, is, I don't is want to do that. Is yet. this mitochondrial DNA or something like that? Um. It has to do with mitochondrial DNA. It also has to do with haplotypes. And I really think with, with that which haplotypes? haplotypes. And I really think the haplotypes are the uh, the the place where they're getting more pressure. And I'll tell you why. Mitochondrial DNA, as I said before, pushes us to two hundred thousand years. That's down from where they expected it to be. They thought it would be millions of years. And furthermore, if you revise it by experimental rates of a mitochondrial mutation, it pushes you to about 6,500, you know. Uh, and, and again, those things are probably having, you know, plus or minus 95% confidence limits of about uh, a factor of two. So it's four to eight. 
So, yeah. Uh, but it's certainly within the 6,000 range, and certainly, you know, 7,500 would still be in the range. But if, if, you're going with the, if you're going with the mitochondrial data, we're actually being pushed in that direction. Now, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the data from uh, male chromosomes. Uh, the Y chromosome, because it turns out that the Y chromosome, as I think will be mentioned next week, um, is actually less variable than most of the other. It's less variable even than 25% of the variation on the other chromosomes, which is what we would kind of expect. Um, y chromosomes don't, don't mutate very much which is amazing considering that human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes are wildly different. Like 30% brand new material and the material they do have is totally mixed up. We've uh, been through that before, but maybe uh, uh, another time we should bring up that stuff because we now have gorilla and the gorilla is actually much closer to humans than chimpanzees are in the Y chromosome, which is a little surprising. Now, by much, I mean instead of 30% new material, they have 15% new material. So it's still wild. And when you think that we're supposed to be 97 or 98 or 99, depending on who's mm -hmm. counting, percent chimp, and it's like 30% brand new material. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, when they did the chimpanzee human thing, they said that the Y chromosome is as different in chimpanzees and humans as the autosomes are between chickens and humans. Uh, that's an actual quote from the, uh, from the or a very, very close paraphrase from the article. Uh, I'm trying to think of the author's name. Uh, David Page was the last author. He probably knows more about this than anybody else. And, uh, and it was, I think, in Nature. And if, you, if you're interested in that, um, Google... Human and, y, uh, ch uh, human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes, chromosomes are horrendously different. And I put my name with it, and there is a presentation that I did that has all of the references in it. So you can look them up. And most of them, uh, although I, it was a year or two ago, so I'm not sure how many of them are still active, but you can... You can get them if you go to uh, Google Scholar. You can find where the if if they don't come up on the on the IR um, on the website address, uh, uh, you can find out what the new website address is because most of these still have a website address. Have you read the book by Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> In fact, uh, well, I shouldn't. S I I've read both of them, and one of them we actually had uh, Fritz Guy and Brian Bull come in here to class and present a couple of t couple of times. Uh, once I they presented and I responded. Once I presented and they responded, and uh, so yeah, and those are on. On the internet, on, on the first one, God's Sky and Land. But the, does it make sense that the, the people that what they're saying is they uh, wrote what they believe was all then, but it can't be the same worldview we have now? Yeah. Well, both of them really fall into the category of uh, of theistic evolutionists 
and depending on what on how you define it um, they um, they're certainly not friendly to intelligent design although I have to be careful of characterizing people because some people some people move from where their official stance used to be and I don't want to be uh, saying that this is the way they were, are, and always will be. Um, because interesting things can happen without my knowing about it. Why did you get the idea evolution? Well, you probably haven't had as uh, many conversations with them as I have. About that specific subject. No, all I'm saying is that people who were at the bottom of the circle, they didn't know what we know today. Well, uh, there's, there's some truth to that, too. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, some in the scientific community have kind of uh, deliberately ignored uh, what they used to say because they feel they were old fashioned. And while their scientific knowledge may not be as great as ours, their historical knowledge may be better than ours, and we just forget about that. You know, we're going to we're going to catch your voice because uh, people are going to want to know what you say, and we're not we're not catching it. So here's a here's a microphone for you. Uh, I once read a paper years ago now that they did trace uh, humans back to two individuals. Have you heard that? Um, yes, I have. That's what we're talking about by mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. Uh, well. There is very little controversy in the literature today that all women go back to one woman and all men yeah. go back to one man. And that was one of the things we were discussing is how long ago was that? If you take the human and chimp uh, mitochondrial differences as your key, uh, then you put it about 200,000 years ago. If you take differences between women today as your key, it turns out that it's more like 6,500 plus or minus 2,000 years. Other questions or comments? Um, yeah, we have one over here. It, it, we'll get you. I was wondering if you might comment on the, the predictive power of science, and the reason I was thinking about this is because of the, the images that were constructed of this black hole this last week. And you know, this is something that was theorized since the early 1900s, and uh, they've worked on it and worked on it, and they finally have, they put the image together. So. Can we apply the same thing to biology? Um, physical objects are much simpler than biological objects. Are you saying much, physics, physics has an unfair advantage? Simpler. Yeah, physics have an unfair advantage. Um, and uh, yeah, predicting what happens in biology is a lot harder. A lot harder. And. Uh, do you think all scientists view it that way? Well, Jerry Coyne does. <laughs> Jerry Coyne actually comments that, uh, that uh, evolutionary biology is closer to phrenology than to physics. And uh, uh, there are a lot of people who say that biologists have physics envy. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, what 
well, the, the biologist will say that. And like Jerry Coyne's a biologist, and he knows. Yeah. I ran into that, that situation. Uh, but trying to uh, do an experiment at the uh, University of Hawaii in, in Hawaii and in, in Hawaii. Uh, on coral reef growth, you know, and boy, those coral varied, varied, that, you know, you measure dozens, sometimes 36 to try and get a figure that differs from another one. And then I had to, uh, I was studying the effect of light, and then I had to calibrate my light and stuff, and man, you know, no problem light, no variability, I could get down, right down the line. I thought, man, uh, why didn't I do physics instead of biology? <laughs> because it's, some things are so simple. Yes, uh, Jack. Well, just a very brief uh, comment. I've, of course, lived, lived with that distinction for all my professional life. But there is a... Uh, Physicists would have a hard time limiting the sample of variables they're measuring to under billions. Biologists have huge samples at 10 to 15 often. The inherent difference in variability and the ability to make statistical prognostications is huge. Oh, yeah, and, and a small difference. I mean, biology systems are not linear. Some of them are, but many of them are not. You know, a 5% difference in, uh, in temperature or in, uh, in light can make a 100% difference in growth. <laughs> and sometimes a 20% difference in light makes no difference in growth. And it's really hard to be able to say which one you should expect. Um, you know, whereas, you know, F equals MA, that's a precise uh, relationship, and uh, quantum mechanics can be, you know, worked to 13 decimal places. Yes. Well, anyway, next week we'll be discussing, are we really 99% chimp? So have fun. <laughs>